Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Paul McLennan, MSP, a member of the Parliament's Social Justice and Social Security Committee, and I would like to welcome you to the 2022 Festival of Politics organised by the Scottish Parliament. This year we celebrate the festival's 18th year of provoking, inspiring and informing people of all ages and from every walk of life to engage in three days of spirited debate. We are delighted that you can join us today online to participate on this debate on disability and the future of work. And I would encourage you all to use the question and answer box to introduce yourselves, stating your first name only and geographical location. You can also use that box to pose any questions you would like the panel to respond to. If you are keen to share your thoughts on social media, you can do so by using the hashtag, hashtag FOP2022. I am very pleased today to be joined by an expert panel. Let me introduce them. Our first panellist is Bella Gore. Bella is Head of Legal and, and Content with Business Disability Forum, a lawyer with over 20 years' experience of disability discrimination law, including she has provided lead reviews and improvement processes for many organisations, including banks and government agencies. Moving on, Professor Phil Taylor is Professor of Work and Employment Studies at the University of Strathclyde. He has researched and published widely on many subjects, including the future of work, occupational health and COVID-19. Our next panellist is Naomi Watt. Naomi has worked for Inclusion Scotland for six years, an expert in accessible recruitment practices and workplace adjustments. Naomi manages the National We Can Work Internships Programme, which aims to make employment more accessible for disabled people. And finally, Sathpal Singh is an independent consultant in agile delivery and digital transformation. A former software engineer, he has over 20 years' experience of management and leadership roles across the public, private and voluntary sectors. He is also one of the lead organisers in the Future of Work in Scotland, a community meetup group exploring how work and the workplace are changing. I would also like to welcome and thank our BSL interpreters, Max Gregg and Heather Graham, who are working with us today. So welcome all. So just to set a little bit of the scene about what the event is all around about today, I'm aware that many of our audience will have direct personal experience of the issues, and I'd be keen to bring in questions and thoughts from you all. If you'd like to put anything in, in, uh, into our panel, please use the Q&A function that you'll see. I'm going to ask, uh, start by asking a couple of questions. I want to ask first about how work in general is changing, particularly since the COVID pandemic. I'm going to go first to Professor Taylor and then to Sathpal. Phil, you've done research on how the pandemic changed the experience of work for people. What changed, and how is the world of work different now from three years ago? Well, that is a $64,000 million question and a very important one, because really what COVID has done is transformed work in many essential respects for millions of people. I mean, I conducted a study of and this is probably one of the most important manifestations, isn't it? One of the outcomes of working from home. Um, almost three and a half thousand office workers uh, I, I, I researched, and there's no question that what we saw from March 20 on, 2020 onwards was an abrupt, involuntary, forced change, if you like, where we saw the transposition of the office to people's working at homes. Prior to the pandemic, only 5% of people had worked mainly from home. That rose to 46%. We're now currently in a situation where the latest figures show 14% are exclusively working from home and 25% in hybrid arrangement. So this is a momentous change. Now, what, what we know from this and from what, what my evidence shows is that this is not the case that this has led to somehow autonomous slacking by people at home, but in fact, a third of people report that the volume, intensity and pace and pressure of work at home has intensified, and that we have, and this is interesting in terms of new technology and automation and the future of work, extensive monitoring, 45% say the automated systems are monitoring their work at home. There's evidence, too, of increasing presenteeism when people are working from home. They're more likely to work when ill at home as opposed to going to the workplace. What does this mean? Very quickly. Um, we have seen a rise, unfortunately, in work-related stress, depression and anxiety through this period. 
There are many more cases. There are 822,000 cases across the UK now, um, and over half of them say that this has been attributed by the pandemic or related to it. Now, why does this matter? It matters massively for disabled people. Um, for one thing, we found that when working from home, things like ergonomic posture in working environment has to support people, yet 55% of my respondents said that they did not get reminders about display screen equipment regulations. That is to say, the adjustments that are necessary for disabled people to be able to make those uh, to, 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 to make work safe and comfortable at home. And I'll finish on this point. There are other issues that I can raise later. But in total, 37% of my sub of those surveyed said that physical health had worsened across the, pa the pandemic, and 40% said their mental health had worsened. Now, some had increased, but those reporting that it had worsened was greater than those who had said that it had um, that, that, that that were greater than had said it improved. So these are these are these are extremely important questions. There are other cultural shifts that I'd like to talk about later on. Well, thank you for that. I'm going to bring South Pal in just a second. Just the point that you made, Phil. I'm, I want to try and ask you on one of the key issues. I think certainly from the social justice committee that's setting us is actually people who have disabilities at the moment coming into the workplace or coming back to the workplace. Have you found home working has any difference in bringing people back to the workplace at all? Or is, is, is that something that you, know, you have evidence on at this stage? Yeah, one, one, um, one important piece of evidence that comes out of my extensive studies is the fact that where transportation and travel to work, commutes and so on, this has been a benefit for many disabled people being able to work from home. Now, it's not a complete benefit because there are those ergonomic considerations of working from home, our risk assessments conducted and so on. But travel to work would appear to be one area that seems to have benefited um, disabled people. One thing, there, there is a huge question here that I do wish to throw in right at the very beginning, and that is we have a situation where the latest figures show that 270,000 fewer people are in employment now than before the pandemic. These are all UK figures. It's not automation that's doing this, and these, there are disability implications here because it would appear that long COVID is taking has taken quite a lot of people out of the workforce and is leading to premature retirement and so on. Contradictorily, there is evidence from the last fortnight that some of those who have left the workforce, many of them disabled by long COVID, are now considering or returning to the workforce what workforce because of the cost of living um, crisis they simply cannot afford to 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 be outside of paid employment well thank you for that I'm sure we'll touch on these subjects as as a discussion debate Sapal I'm going to bring your, your, your yourself in, in in terms of that in, in your work you look at broader trends in work do yeah. these changes fit into a longer term trend or what are the what are the key changes in work that you're seeing yeah, I'd agree with some of what Phil covered there. I, I think the key thing is remote working is not going to go away. So, you know, in my sort of industry, I'm already used to that, very comfortable working in that way because, you know, I'm in technology, I work for large global enterprises, and a lot of people that I collaborate with typically are not the same countries as me or, in some cases, the same continents. So, I'm kind of very comfortable with that, but we've certainly seen a huge shift there as we, many of us experience. We've gone from co-located working environments to distributed work environments, which is what I was typically used to, right through to disperse. We were all in our own homes and we're trying to find ways to collaborate. I think we've proven that we can work effectively from home. So a lot of organizations have had to effectively change their strategies in a hurry. As Phil said, you know, we've been disrupted. You know, it's been aggressive. We've had to respond quickly and adapt to these things. To sustain ourselves and keep you know things going, um, and, and we've learned a lot by doing that. But we've proven that it's workable, and also in many cases, I think a lot of folks, certainly in my sorts of industries, uh, we can and typically are actually more productive. But then the flip side of that is stuff Phil touched on a moment ago around you know well-being, you know you know watching the hours that we work and the cultural things that we're seeing creeping in. So I'm sure we'll come back to some of that. 
I think the automation piece that was touched on earlier is important because because we're now dispersed and a lot of us aren't physically going back to offices. It means in some cases some industries will be further disrupted because the contactless nature of work will kick in. And we want to introduce more self-service type products and services, which ultimately you can only really do through greater automation uh, and adoption of artificial intelligence, for example. So those trends, I think, are going to continue and amplify over the coming decade or so. Zathbal, thank you for that. I'm going to bring in uh, Bella and Naomi just in a little second. One, one question, I suppose, Zathbal, for me is, are you noticing a difference in, if we're talking about the move from home working? Has it been the same for smaller companies as against the larger companies? Has there been any differences you're finding in that? Or has it been as easy to move to home working for the smaller organisation that might have three, four, five people rather than some that might have two or three thousand people, for example? It's definitely different, uh, and I think, to be honest, it will depend on a number of things. One of them will be size. So obviously, small organisations can do that much more quickly and much more readily uh, than larger, you know, global enterprises like, you know, my employer. However, I think a lot of it will also depend on culture and also what kind of work you're in. I'm sure, we'll come back to explore that later. But I think sector and type of occupation, and you know, the, the necessity of you know, geographical proximity to the people you're serving, if you're in a more of a sort of, you know, customer facing type environment will have implications for where you need to be and how you need to work. I think, as I mentioned earlier, I think the key thing here is there's been a lot of positives out of this too, because organizations have had to accelerate their technology strategies and the digital transformations because they're, they're to just continue to sustain themselves and survive. And continue to operate in whatever market they're in, and, and I think there's some good out of that. There's quite a lot of unpack to unpack there, really. Yeah, I, I'm sure we'll, we'll get into that discussion in a broader context. So, Pal, thank you for that. With that context, I, I, I want to focus a little bit more on the experience of disabled people in particular. I'm going to go to Bella first and Naomi, and I suppose, Bella, what are the key barriers to disabled people getting into employment? And what opportunities do you see from, I suppose, from the changes outlined by both Phil and, and, and Sathpal? Yeah, I think um, three A's come to mind, assumptions, attitudes, and adjustments. And by assumptions, I mean assumptions about who disabled people are, what they can do, but also what they want. And just um, reflecting on what Phil was saying is transportation. Yes, a lot of disabled people did want to work from home prior to the pandemic, and it was the most re uh, requested reasonable adjustment um, and was often refused for reasons that the pandemic has proved not to be um, you know, viable, it's per perfectly possible to do. But on the other hand, I've spoken to lots of disabled people who don't want to work from home. They want to come into the office, they uh, want to work with other people. There's a real mental health challenge for some people for being isolated. And also, it isn't sort of to let um, transport providers off the hook in making transportation accessible for disabled people, because if it's an assumption that, oh, well, every disabled person who's got a mobility disability, mobility related disability can work from home, then we trap people because they can't go out for leisure either. Um, and there's this assumption that, you know, keep people in their homes and they can do a job and they're productive and that's all that matters. So I think there's some assumptions around that and attitudes as well that go with that and attitudes about what disabled people can do and what can change in the workplace that things don't have to be done the way that they were always done. Um, the pandemic proved that to be the case. And adjustments. And by adjustments, I don't mean special equipment or special things for special people. I've got quote marks there on the special because it's that um, attitude of we are all individuals. And I think it's moving on from that slightly 19th century view that we've got standardized workplaces with standardized equipment and the one size fits all. And it doesn't. I mean, I said earlier, I'm sort of very small. I'm four foot ten. Why would I have wanted the same chair or keyboard or desk as somebody who's six foot two? It's always been the case that we're different. But in the past, employers have tried to fit us into a standardized box. Um, and I think maybe this is an opportunity for that flexibility to recognize that people are individuals, um, regardless of disability. Bella, thank you for that. I'm going to ask um, Naomi just in, in a little, uh, not a second, the same question. I suppose the key thing, Bella, you mentioned obviously around about everybody's different and, and so on. Are you seeing, as I suppose, our businesses and government agencies, for example, 
uh, engaging with people with disabilities enough, or does that need to be looked at even even more uh, in terms of that? Is that something that, you, in your role, are you seeing? Uh, are you seeing that? Yeah, I think disability is having a moment, but um, our members and business disability forum forum members are either on the large side. They're large corporates, large government agencies. Very much so, disabled people's voices in um, ERGs or staff disability networks are coming through. I'm not so sure about smaller employers, uh, which are the majority, of course, and particularly in Scotland. And I do think that disability might be having a bit of a, a moment, again in air quotes, in our cultural life. So, you know, on baking contests or dancing contests on television, on goggle box, you know, you see disabled people, but I don't know that it's actually, and Naomi will probably answer this better, is I don't see that translating into employment because the disability employment gap stays stubbornly high. So what is happening with that we see disabled people advertising now and they're recognized, people we're seeing people like us are more recognized, but not um, uh, not coming through in the employment rates. Bella, that, that, that's, I'm sure that's something we picked up. Normie, just on the same question, mm -hmm. what are the key barriers and what opportunities have we had? And I suppose just in the point uh, that Bella mentioned at the end, around about more advocacy, I suppose, in terms of uh, in terms of that, is there work needing to be done in, in in that regard? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Paul. So, um, totally echo Bella's points um, as well. But um, from from a disabled persons organisation perspective, which is where I um, uh, work for Inclusion Scotland. There's, there's factors even um, before someone gets into employment, you know, there's barriers at education level um, and we've seen the shift of universities moving to more online courses. Well, that has advantages and disadvantages to a lot of disabled people. Um, and sometimes the education that they're receiving that they would have received before COVID, post COVID is not at the same level. It's not very accessible. Um, so that's also impacting um, uh, the, the, the chances to move on to employment. Um, we've got employment support organisations in um, general, you know, things to do with Fair Start Scotland. Um, and some of those organisations um, may not be as informed around supporting disabled people specifically. Um, so there has been a change of some employment spe um, impairment specific employment um, support organisations that were maybe sort of linked with disabled people's organisations um, getting lack of funding, so it's moved to the more general organisations, which do a lot of good work. But sometimes, when it comes to adjustments and understanding about barriers that disabled people face, they're not as um, well informed on on that side of things. Um, and then we've got recruitment side as well, so things to do with applications, role descriptions, lack of flexibility, um, no kind of um, indications of adjustments when employers are putting jobs on um, vacancies on site, so no sort of links to um, uh, a, a contact in HR they can request reasonable adjustments for, or they're open to um, more disabled people applying for their jobs. Um, and so in relation to what Bella was saying and her final point, I, I would say that we kind of need to move away from looking at disabled people specifically and focus on employers and try to create the learning and the support with employers. And we've kind of coined it as employer ability rather than employability. So employability is is um, uh, just make sort of um, disabled people making themselves more employable. Why don't we shift that and look at employers and making themselves more um, accessible, more supportive, um, more aware of adjustments. And so more disabled people are likely to be attracted to, to those roles because of the, the way that the, the dialogue is changing, the culture is changing. And I think that's really going to help make a change to, to kind of the disability and employment gap. And that's a lot of the work that I do at the moment is focused on on employers themselves. No, I mean, thanks for that. And, and just to, uh, to back up that point, I mean, I think around about six months ago, I co-hosted an event with the DWP where we invited employers. And there was over 50 employers from East Lothian came along to that event. And it was around about how, you know, what they can do rather than, as you said, the, the other way about, and I think that's incredibly important. And I suppose, Naomi, Bella, I suppose from, from, your, from your own point of view and the work that you do, do we know enough? I mean, obviously, the, you mentioned about obviously the number of people with disabilities getting back into work. Do we understand enough the disabilities? Every disability, is obviously, is different. Do we understand or do we have enough information on that, that people with disabilities in each area around about what more needs to be done? 
because I said each disability will be different, each workplace will be different. Do we need to look at that a little bit more in detail, or, or what's your thoughts around about that? So either Naomi, Bella, what's your, how you bring in Naomi, probably yourself, and then Bella to add in if she's anything yeah, else to it. Absolutely, I would I would say we really need to value lived experience. So that is the experience that disabled people face, unique to their own situation, um, and try and move away from generalisations because you can get into real muddy water when you, you you kind of try to think about stereotypes relating to impairment because you know I, i've worked in this field for, for a long time and i learn something new every day um you know people's experiences are very unique and actually if if employers are aware of um uh their the, the who kind of is, is working with them their barriers their impairment types things that they can learn so much more from their own staff and if they're not kind of tapping into their own staff experiences, um, then maybe we kind of need to look at that a bit more because that is really truly how you're going to understand the, the true impact of kind of your policies and your procedures and how maybe you can tweak things. That's where you're going to get the most impact. No, and well, thank you for that. And I think Bella, I'll bring yourself in uh, just on the same point. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree with um, Naomi. On, on the lived experience, but it's also employers do need support. And I completely agree that it's employers who need to um, change, but they do need support. And I think things like access to work, um, it could be better. It's brilliant. It's a little known scheme where there's government help or adjustments. Most adjustments don't cost very much at all. So a lot of that is wrapped down to attitudes. But also on that point, uh, Naomi was making about education, that transition between education to employment could be could be so much better. I mean, the Dis Disabled Students Allowance and access to work, they don't talk to each other. So any adjustments that a student has um, in university and college, um, and there was an example um, that I heard about recently, there was a young woman, she was deaf, she was at university and she had her adjustments, she had everything she needed for university. She got a placement as part of her course um, with an employer. The DSA adjustments that she had vanished, she had to apply to access to work adjustments, she couldn't get them they for the entire time that she was there, which was a year. Part of that was that for six months, um, access to work hadn't logged that she was deaf and they were trying to call her. Um, so six months later, they were registered that she wasn't going to answer the phone and the process started. The adjustments were in place at the end of her one year placement and she went back to university. And it's that sort of joined up thinking that we really need the same with um, uh, in schools, I mean, I heard another story of a mother who was saying that actually homeschooling at the kitchen table was a godsend because her child had uh, a sight loss, had a visual impairment, and uh, they could try out all the different platforms to find out which one worked best for him at the kitchen table, which the school wasn't able to do. So it's can we join up a bit and help employers out as well? Because it's not just sometimes that they don't want to do the right thing. They need a bit of support, a bit of help. What, what works, what are the barriers, and what are the technologies, what are the adjustments that will overcome them? And not every disabled person knows. They've not been in work before, perhaps. They don't know what's available and possible. So join up a bit. No, Bella, thank you for that. I'm, I'm going to try and open it up. And there's a couple of comments and a question we have here. And first comment is from Chloe, and as an agreement and the point that you made, Bella, around about uh, disability is treated as out of sight, out of mind when employers when they're home working. And we've got a comment from, from Brian Scott, and Brian just kind of touches on the point Bella you mentioned. We also need to understand the barriers faced by those categorised as economically inactive, eh, who, who could work and would also want to work but require support, for example, around about childcare, accessible transport, and so on. There's a lack of data on, on this group. So I'll maybe ask the question on that. And then we have a, a question from Andrew, and Andrew's asking, and I'll open this up to everyone, and then open it up in a much broader basis. Andrew's asking, can we have the same employer index as Stonewall established for LGBTI rights? I don't know if anybody wants to answer that specific question we have from Andrew. Then I'm going to try and open it up around about probably cultural shifts in society, not just in workplaces. But I don't know if anybody wants to come in and, and uh, tackle the point that Andrew's made around about the same employer index as Stonewall. Does anybody want to come in on that one? Bella? Disability standard for a while, which we've shifted to a disability audit. The standard, which is like this index of you know who's the best, sometimes can be counterproductive on there. So we moved away more to a disability audit where um, organisations can self-audit, but they can also 
then go in for an audit where we will um, look at the evidence that they put forward on 10 areas across the entire business, not just recruitment or employment, but across the whole business, because that's what's really important to make it a truly accessible experience for disabled people, um, and to see where they can improve. I, I think the index sometimes can, I, I don't know, other people might disagree, but can actually backfire slightly. Anybody want to get the Oh, Phil, I don't know if you want to start again. We just we missed the start of your, of your, uh, of your comment. I think, there I think this is an incredibly important discussion, and, and I want to refer back to something Bella made earlier on. I mean, I was a little, but I wasn't meaning to be too blunt in saying that, say, you know, transportation was. I mean, that there are a whole number of other issues here that are of great significance. One of the problems is that when moving to working from home, for example. Many of the performance management targets, the disciplines that would apply in the workforce, are, are then apply at home. Now, this disadvantages, and I would say, and discriminates against disabled people of many different types. There's one organisation I probably should not mention. This organisation that has 17 departments, and they have run a performance management system, right? And of the 17 departments. In 13 of them, disabled workers, right, were less likely to have the top level. Were more like, were in all cases, were more likely to have must improve against their performance rankings and ratings. Now, what this indicates is that individuals, uh, individual disabilities, are not being taken into consideration. There's the normalisation of people and squeezed into the box of what a a typical high performing employee should be that discriminates As, and 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 how can we deal with it perhaps this relates something down to the index but all performance management scores across all organizations i think should be transparent accessible and we will be the first detection point for some of the discriminations that take place in the workplace one other point i was at a conference last week where i spoke on on neurodivergent people and neuro, and this is a whole massive area that I'm sure Bella and Naomi and Sapal know about. One seventh of the UK working population is neurodivergent. Okay, um, yet unemployment levels amongst neurodivergent people are about 80 percent. We've got a major structural problem here. So the question of employability that has been raised is crucial. And so too must challenge, be challenging the discriminations and the barriers that exist in these ways. And there is absolutely no room com for complacency here, uh, given that the labour market has shrunk um, as a consequence of COVID. Well, I'm going to open it up and see if anybody else wants to come in. But there's a couple of comments that I think are re very relevant. Uh, we've had a comment from Mark McMillan saying, agree that access to work could be better. It brings in support for disabled people to carry out their work duties, but they don't cover voluntary work, uh, only paid work. This leaves dis uh, disabled people at a considerable disadvantage, as voluntary work is generally recognised as a belief made to boost people's CV. Uh, and uh, Mark's a, a deaf BSL user; he, he won't be apply, uh, uh, won't be able to apply for access to work funding to bring in a BSL interpreter to do voluntary work. What should we think would be done about this? Now, I'm then going to talk around about the, another issue. Kirsty Henderson is making the same point. She says that access to work takes months to get permissions done, waiting 12 weeks plus at present. Big impact on people starting work in the first place if even offered a job. No, ch no change in a decade as still only one in four blind, partially sighted people in work. IRNIV, visibly better employed, also supports employers. So we're talking obviously uh, somebody obviously with a, a deaf BSL user, and obviously somebody I would assume Kirsty with issues around about our site and so on. So I think just what you've said there, Phil, has been backed up by two you know two people who are trying to get access to work. It doesn't cover uh, voluntary work, and it doesn't cover obviously um, visibly impaired people. Naomi Bella, I don't know if you, based on where you are in Southwell, feel free obviously to come in, but Naomi uh, probably yourself and then. Then, Bill, is, are you picking up this, th these issues um, yeah. and, and the work that you deal with? I'm mean, not you in that first of all. Yeah, absolutely, Paul. It's a it's a, a, a huge frustration on on um, on, on disabled people's organisations. Um, I'm part of a, a feedback group, stakeholder group with um, other disabled people's organisations, 
um, to directly feed back to, to access to work. The major barriers that still people are facing, delays in application processing, sort of um, loopholes in their, in their structure where if you seem to apply before you've started your job, you get put to the top of the processing list. But at no point does it say that in the guidance online, so people aren't aware of that. So they're only aware of that if say they're working with myself or another another person who who does kind of have this information. There's ways of getting around certain um, uh, issues with applications if they're asking for a personal contribution, for instance. And it, it gets very complicated because there's all these sort of secrets with access to work. It's often not used by a lot of employers because they don't know about it. And then when they do find out about it, they're either completely put off because of the delays, the issues, then 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 the, the staff member getting exceptionally stressed out because they're trying to get the, the adjustments that they need. The employer obviously doesn't know really what to do and how to support. And, and you've got this awful situation going on with so many disabled people in work that it, it really does have to be um, tackled. And um, I think it's one of the most, um, you, you've kind of got over the hurdle of getting a job, which is enormous. And there's enormous barriers in, in for a lot of disabled people. And then when you've got the job, you, you're then often completely like hit with a ridiculous level of, of bureaucratic process and and that often means some disabled people aren't even um, able to take on the job um, so you know it's it's really unacceptable but I appreciate it's access to work have also said they've received an enormous a big rise in applications over the last six months because of the move to returning back to the office and people's change in circumstances Long COVID has also increased applications yeah, access to work, so people's impairment type are changing. So they've had to do a big recruitment drive and get more people in. So they're obviously dealing with a lack of staff as well. But I do find a lot of things are getting blamed on COVID. And it's kind of like, well, how much longer can we keep that going when really just we just need to see results for disabled people in work? I mean, thank you for that. Bella, and then I'm going to bring in Seth Powell for the, you, your views on that as well. But Bella, are you, are you picking up the same issues? De definitely picking up the same issues as, as Naomi, and I would say you know, a, a few things that would really help. I mean, I know access to work, like everybody else, has got some staff shortages in there, but one, train access to work advisors, because one employer uh, who was a disability confident employer called them up and asked about access to work, and the job centre advisor didn't know what access to work was, um, and also didn't know what disability confident was. So training and joining up on there, and advertise access to work better. A lot of employers, as Naomi says, don't know that it exists. A lot of disabled people don't know that it exists. And streamlining, maybe a little bit of investment just in streamlining those processes. But a lot of our member employers, and I said the large corporates in, on the whole, they bypass access to work now. Um, they don't bother going down that route. They just pay for the adjustments um, and make the assessments themselves, and they, they use their own resources because Partly because they say, well, maybe they should leave the funding as well for smaller employers, um, but it would be nice if the smaller employers could actually access it. Bella, thank you for that. Seth, Paul, I wanted to ask you a specific question. Obviously, your experience is across the both public, private and voluntary sectors. Do you find, we talked about access to work, do you find there are differences in how, I suppose, efficient these areas are, whether it's private, public or voluntary? Did, you know, is there a difference in the sectors about how they look at access to work, how they talk about um, uh, you know, disability uh, confident um, workplaces? Do you find there's a difference in, in that way? Is there one sector better than another? Is there lessons to be learned from one area from another? Yeah, um, I'd say they are. They're, they're quite different, I guess. So I think having worked across all three, as you say, um, I think naturally the, the voluntary sector is well placed to help educate many of us on how we can open up voluntary roles more broadly. So listening to my fellow panellists, I think one of the things it feels like we need to do better is have a more holistic view and an understanding of who's offering what services. Take a more joined up approach. Um, as a serial volunteer myself, um, alongside my kind of day job, one of the things I'm very passionate about is the fact that you know volunteering roles help us build skill sets. In some cases, we can't traditionally typically build in our day to day jobs. I think it's a tremendous way to help people learn other skills and help them transition into other sectors and other occupations. And I'd like to see that improve. Obviously, the charity sector has a big part to play in supporting us. 
obviously the funding really a lot of that sits in the private sector and I think the private sector and public sector need to be kind of talking more um, and trying to figure out how to kind of you know make sure that the private sector is supportive and also perhaps you know providing an investment where that's possible and practical and I think a lot of obviously the legislation and our understanding of how this stuff works and whatever frameworks we have is typically all sitting you know within you know within the public sector so I think to Bella made the comment earlier, and I can agree with that. I just feel like you know, it's not just this; it's in a lot of things. We we've never just joined up enough. You know, different bodies don't know who's doing what. In some cases there's duplication, and we're not making enough impact. So how how do we change that? He's kind of really my perspective, I'm listening to I'm not kind of yeah. on this. Just on that, I'm going, to, I'm going to obviously say to our audience, we've got around about 20 minutes of questions left. The last five minutes, I'm going to ask each of our panelists and give them notice just to say, give one minute around about the most important things that have come out today. So, if anybody wants to put comments or questions in, please feel free to, to do that in, in the chat. I'm going to try and move on to. We, we talked about obviously shifts in attitude. Now, we're talking about shifts of attitude in, with an employer and so on. Is there a broader understanding of, of a those in the public awareness of a diverse, uh, diverse workforce? Um, and is there, is there that understanding about you know how it, that can be contributed to, to, to not not just workforce but obviously to the wider society? Um, I, I'm going to open that up to that one. Whether I think there's been a change in perception or a change in views of the wider population uh, in that regard. So I don't know who wants to come in. Probably Phil, I'll bring in in, in that one regard. Are we moving in the right direction in terms of how the public sees this uh, this issue? Um. I think it's a really mixed bag out there. I think what Bella particularly related to before is is extremely important, and that is any any sense and understanding of the importance of disability has to come from the disabled people themselves, the self definitions, the articulation of their experience, and organisations making adjustments, and they should be making adjustments. Apart from anything else, we have the Equality Act. With, with all its uh, with its with its all its clauses, we have a raft of health and safety legislation and regulations that it would appear that the two contenders for the Conservative leadership race wish to scrap, burn up in a bonfire of controls. But let's make no mistake: the consequences of the proposed um, uh, removal of protections on workers proposed by the Conservative Party leaders. Uh, is extremely serious for all workers, but particularly for disabled workers as well. So I think these questions are becoming more acute in the public domain. I think the legitimacy of people's genuine experiences of disability has to come to the fore in this. And I think in broader society there is a there is a wider wider recognition of this, but it runs up into into many of the obstacles. I repeat, it's, it, it's not merely a case of of one disability, we have to remember the intersectional disability that people suffer as well. Now, this is understood, but I don't want to use the word suffer, experience rather. So, for example, you have a woman who's older, who's perhaps autistic, would 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 run into multiple cases of uh, multiple instances of pressures or vectors of of potential discrimination and exclusion here. Now, this is really something i think our, our job i think there's a general a generalized sense that this is broader yes in society but it has to be taken it has to be really taken on and i repeat my point which i think is really concrete and important at the moment two million people in britain have long covid right one fifth of those will be incapacitated from working as they did do because of long covid an employment tribunal case in Scotland in June, you may, may or may not be aware of this, um, it's an extremely important one, determined that long COVID was a disability under the Disability Discrimination Act. So, I'm sorry, the DDA, gosh, I'm thinking in old terms, the Equality, the Equality Act. And, and, and it's instances like these that I think really prompt us to make sure that we grow wider and encourage Greater public awareness. 
Oh, well, thank you for that. I'm going to bring in Naomi, and, and I'll see if, if Bella and, and Sathbell come on in. Before I, I bring in Naomi, there's a comment that's coming from Sally, and very, I think a very important point. It would be good for workplaces to become more accessible and inclusive by design. It's often that the challenges cannot be fixed by access to work alone because there are issues that are systemic. So I think, you know, we're talking about design and workplace is very important. Needs as a member that disabled people have a right to dignity should always they should not always be forced into positions where they repeatedly and strangely have to disclose their needs before simple adjustments are made. So uh, and, and Andrew's asking as well, and I'm going to bring this up in terms of that, and I'm now actually come back and Phil, if anybody knows this. Andrew's asking in many cases from individuals have been able to raise a case in the court of session to uphold Polyac who cannot get legal aid. I.e., the missing middle. But I'll actually come back in uh, in a second, Phil, on that one. But no, we just on the, the point where we talked about about I suppose changes in society generally, yeah. and obviously the work you do, you'll be speaking to a mm. broad uh, range of people. Totally. So there's a couple of points, really. I think um, it's great. It's really positive that you know um, disability access barriers are getting discussed more and more, especially in the media. You're seeing news reports about lots of different kind of people's experiences of whether it's to do with accessing services um, employment, you know, quite, quite a number of different things. Um, but we do have to be careful of the narrative. So often narrative around disabled people is surrounded with pity and inspiration. Um, in line with the social model of disability um, and disabled people are, are, are disabled by barriers presented in society through a variety of different situations. But sometimes media um, portrayal is is just just continuing people's thoughts around. Oh, I, I must help this disabled person because it's the right thing to do, and oh, I must feel sorry, and oh gosh, aren't they such an inspiration? But actually, uh, you know, that's sort of totally misleading people on on um, disabled people's um, rights and abilities to work because it's shifting perspectives. So that's something to just be um, really aware of when you're looking at news reports. Um, Where's the narrative coming from here? And in relation to what Phil was saying about um, long COVID, that's also been um, accepted by Access to Work as well. So if someone is experiencing long COVID, um, then they will be able to access support from Access to Work. And they changed that earlier on this year. Naomi, thank you for that. Bella, I'm going to bring yourself in and then South Pal after that. Bella, just on the point that's been made about the general cultural shift in society, and obviously. Just to comment on the point that, that Andrew made as well around about the, the, the cases in the court session, you uh, cannot get legal aid. I think that's incredibly important. I don't know if you, if you have any uh, any knowledge of that. I know it's uh, in terms of that, but if you've a number yeah, of cases and um, issues that you're picking up. But Bella, just on the, the cultural shift, but also on the point Andrew made. Okay, on, on the cultural shift, I mean, I think there is some awareness amongst some employers now of the benefits of, of um, employing disabled people. Um, and it is a business case. I know of one, um, I'll, I'll make them nameless, one bank that is actively poaching from disabled neurodivergent people from other banks um, in their IT systems because you know, they, they want people who've been trained up and are, are working well in this. So there is some awareness around that. I think there was a report pre-pandemic 2018 by Accenture in, this, in the United States which showed um, the disability inclusion advantage, where it said that um, companies that were um, uh, had increased their inclusion of disabled people were outperforming their peers for shareholder returns by four times. Um, so there is, and that was done by Accenture, so that was quite interesting. It was pre-pandemic. So there is some awareness around the benefits. And, you know, people have already talked about problem solving and, um, there is a, a moment, I think, there is an opportunity now where things are so, it's possible to be so flexible and to be so inclusive, this inclusion by design. We got so many calls um, during the pandemic about uh, platforms like this one, like Zoom, like Teams. How can we make them most accessible? How can we make sure that everybody is included? Um, which ones have uh, the, the, you know, the greatest number of accessibility features? And companies like Microsoft were falling over themselves to try and prove that theirs was the most accessible. So there is a, a cultural shift and there's an opportunity now, now more than ever before, and Asapa might be the one to, to talk about that, but it's this sort of technology does help um, and, at, and helps to shift attitudes. On Andrew's specific point, um, of course, legal aid, it's, it's gone down and down over the years. It's many, many years since I took actual cases. It was in England, but I remember taking a case to the Court of Appeal, equivalent, 
in um, England uh, to the Court of Sessions, and I had to beg favours, basically. I worked for a law centre, and I was ringing up barristers to say, it's a really, really interesting case, you'll do it for free, won't you? Um, because we haven't got any money. And yeah, it's that there is there is no funding, um, and I don't see that changing. And then, you know, there's things like the employment bill. Yeah. What happened to it? It sort of vanished. Well, I think that's important because I, I think from my point of view, and I'll bring South Palin in a second, because I think you, you led him in and it, beautifully into the, you know, it has, has a part. I think that's really important because the things that have come out today are things that I can take back to the Social Security Committee and Social Justice Committee and say, look, these are the issues that have been raised. We need as a committee to look at that. So this has been really helpful. South Palin, with that beautiful leading we got from Bella, just on obviously the culture uh, mm -hmm. shift. What have, you, what have you picked up? What's your experience? Uh... I think there's a cultural shift. I think in a lot of the organisations I've worked with over the last you know, five years or so, quite different sectors, different industries, there's a greater recognition that we do need to do more, and that's resulting in you know initiatives springing up uh, to support this. I think one of the things I see now, I do puzzle over, is we have all these sort of diversity, equality, inclusion initiatives, and I think, sadly, what I—that's my personal experience—is often I see they're focused a lot on the gender balance piece or, you know, greater inclusion of ethnicities, which again is obviously these are all important. And certainly in my sort of industry, you know, we have a huge, still a huge imbalance, uh, gender imbalance for engineers, etc. And a lot of the sort of initiatives I, I'm involved in, but then I don't hear enough of a conversation around some of the, you know, stuff we've covered today around, you know, the. the greater inclusion of those with disability. I was pleased to hear Phil talking about, you know, neurodiversity, because I'm active in the British Computer Society, who are the UK industry body for IT. I've been with them my entire career. I'm now a chartered fellow and I'm the chair of one of the specialist groups. And only very recently uh, we've introduced a, a, a neurodiversity specialist group. So I think these things are starting to happen. We are seeing the shifts, but it still, you know, it, it feels quite slow, and I think, you know, there needs to be greater emphasis and more investment, as I said earlier. And, and I think the big thing is education. I think a lot of us need greater education, and I, I do know a lot of colleagues and a lot of the collaborations I'm involved in broadly, globally, in some cases, people do want education. Where is the education, and you know, how how can we then use that to create the kind of environments and cultures? In organisations, in society, and enterprises that we need to have to, to truly be inclusive. That's part of it. You've led us beautifully into the next set of questions. We've got around about eight, nine, ten minutes left in questions. I, I want to ask, and this is across to all the panel, and I'll probably start with Phil for this one. We, we've talked around about what you know, what the issues are, and what the barriers are. And I suppose the question I'm going to ask is, what legal and structural changes need to be to support more people, disabled people, to, into employment? in terms of that, and what should we be doing more in Scotland in terms of, of that regard? We have often heard of the issues around about um, immigration and need of more skilled workers. We obviously had we'd mentioned about Brexit before. We have lost a lot of people to our, our workforce. Phil, you mentioned about the issue around about COVID and so on. So what what needs to be done? Uh, what needs to be changed in Scotland? What message would you send, obviously, to, to, to MSPs? What message would you send to, the, to my committee, for example, of what needs to be done? I'm going to ask everybody to maybe to keep that to about a minute and a half, if possible. Then we'll lead on to the last minute, where I'm going to ask you, to, you know, what's your lead, what's your most important things you've taken out today, and what's your key messages. But what needs to be changed? So, Phil, I'll start with yourself, then go to Naomi, and then South Pal, then Bella. Yeah. Well, first of all, I would say some of the legislation exists. The, the problem is it's not being implemented, or it's not being, or employers are not implementing it, or it's not taken seriously. I mean, some of the, the work that I did in terms of um, you know, the whole working from home experience, you know, it's you, you, where display screen equipment regulations are not being used effectively is going to disadvantage and discriminate against disabled people. This is, there's a requirement on organisations to do this. We have the Health and Safety Work Act of 1974, which, play, which, which carries with it a duty of care. Um, for employees to carry out a duty of being cared for employees. Now, its implementation it means that it now has to cover the home as a workplace. Now, are the risk assessments being carried out? Are employers following this through? I think a key lever 
in, in much of this, and I've, in, I'm involved in actively in the hazards network and various other networks, is it's extremely important that workers have a voice. And workers' voice through trade unions, particularly through trade unions who are incredibly proactive, increasingly proactive in this area, is extremely important. So, I mean, I'm not going to come up with a prescriptive timetable here, but one thing is absolutely true is that existing legislation actually, in many cases, provides the, the, the facility for this to happen. The question often is agency, will, and ability to challenge discriminatory barriers that, 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 that exist, and, and indeed to take action, and indeed to name and shame. And, you know, final, final point. If people are interested, I can send them the – please get in touch with me, I'll send them some of my, my, my work. But this major UK organisation, which has significant employment in Scotland, can be seen through its performance management ratings and rankings to be discriminated against Asian older people, disabled people, black ethnic minority people. I mean, it's as stark as you like. And these things need to be brought from out from under the stones, covered in light, and dealt with. Fellow, please please send me that. And just to back up the point that you made, Alexandria has mentioned about the Scottish National Strategy and Autism appears to have been ignored. How can we reinstate and reinforce it in a mandated climate in the workforce to improve services to autistic people? And Alexandria, I've been speaking to a group of people in East Lothian who are having that same issue in terms not just the workplace but obviously access to to childcare and so on. So that's an important issue. Now, Amy, I'm going to bring to yourself then, Safal and Bella. We'll look to finish. If you can keep this to about a minute, this part, and then we'll ask you for your closing statements within a minute as well. Yeah. So, Naomi, to yourself. Yeah. Um, so, I, I think we just we really need to involve disabled people more and um, disabled people's organisations. So, you know, that's really leading on the lived experience of disabled people. We led by and for, for disabled people. So, we really do know what the barriers are and what the challenges are, and we can support with the education. Um, because, like um, Strathfield was saying before, um, you know, there's not a lot of kind of you're seeing kind of stuff about gender balance and um, certain sort of ethnicity um, uh, policies and things. But when it comes to disability, it can be really uncomfortable for people to discuss it because they're so scared of getting it wrong. Now, that's something I get all the time, every day with employers. They don't know how to tackle a topic. They don't know how to discuss it. They don't want to offend anybody, so they don't talk about it. But what I would say is actually kind of acknowledge your fear and maybe you know then then you can try and challenge it and learn more rather than just not have the conversation because we're not actually going to move any further forward but by working with disabled people's organizations learning from lived experience you're going to gradually get more and more comfortable about that topic um, and I'll, I'll leave it at that so you can go to the next um, yeah we've still got our, 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 our minute closing so i'll come back to that so, so that's so and Bella, just, just on on the issue and about what 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 do we need to do in Scotland in terms of... You know, yeah, I, I, I'd echo uh, Naomi's sentiment, actually, because I, I felt the same way for years. I think we have to really, you know, um, focus in on inclusivity to get diversity. You can't have one without the other. And in my industry, certainly, in what, a lot of what I do, I mean, you can't build great digital product without really understanding who you're serving. And if you're building something which is serving a broader demographic, you've got to understand the demographic, and the best way to do that is to build diverse teams. Otherwise, you, you simply can't achieve that. And I still think we're falling short, like significantly, in, in, in that way. If we're going to be truly inclusive, and to me, everyone means everyone. You know, you build truly inclusive, diverse teams, you will build the world-class digital product. And we're, you know, we're, we're a digital world now. We're, a, you know, we've got a digital strategy. These things are crucial, but we can't build products that serve everyone that are accessible if we don't include them in the conversation. Well, thank you for that. And Bella? Uh, yeah, what's to say after all that? I, I would say that the fear of getting it wrong is really important. I think they're um, role models. Disabled people are in work, um, and the more successful they get, the less disabled they are, as in they don't talk about it. because. They can adjust the way that they work. They've got that power to do that. So I think role models, you can't be what you can't see. Um, most disabilities are required. You're not born with them. And most of them, if you, you know, over the age of 53. So if you haven't got a disability yet, the good news is there may well be one coming down the, down the line for those of us who are, you know, over 53. So these people exist. They need to speak. They need to um, acknowledge that they are disabled. 
and that they work with adjustments, they work differently, and that other people can do this too, and build an inclusive design, as people, as, as somebody has said um, in the chat, I think, about designing their workplaces, rather than just making exceptions for themselves. So making sure that, and you know, that people places are um, accessible, inclusive, and a lot of people don't define themselves as disabled. You know, the, the self-identification, it's just, I am what I am, and I need a few things, I need things to be done differently. Will an employer um, be able to accommodate that and to see that? So encourage employers to, to talk about that, to say that we want everyone, we want different people, we've got these different networks, and, and really sort of increase that visibility of disabled people at all levels. So it's good work, it's not just any work, it's good work. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. I'm now going to come across and ask for the one key point, and about, I, I, I need to keep this tight to the one minute this time. So I'm going to ask I'm going to ask Phil to come in uh, first of all, then South Pal, in terms of the one key takeaway uh, uh, within the minute, and then uh, we'll, we can we'll close up at four o'clock. Yeah, I'm going to be really naughty and not refer to stuff that's been talked about today, but I'm going to finish on a point that's emerging from a survey that have just completed a different survey of almost 3,000 engineering workers, including many in Scotland. And it's about working time, okay? And the survey shows that um, there has been, because of COVID, a really profound reappraisal of attitudes to working from home, to work-life balance, to where people wish to spend their time. 94% of people in the survey were in favour of a campaign for shorter working time. Not a shorter work, not necessarily a four-day week, but shorter working time. And I think what this, what what COVID has shown, has exposed or revealed what is most important in our lives. Work is part of it, but work as a means to a far greater work-life balance is really quite fundamental going forward. And therefore. Final, final thing. Yes, we live in a kind of archetypal digital age, but hey, hey, come on. It's a human period we're living through as well. It's a human world, not a digital world. Well, thanks for that. I'm sure we could have another hour on that subject uh, alone. Um, I'm going to go to Naomi and then Bella and then Saf. So, Naomi, is thanks, your, your final takeaway from the event? Um, well, I would say that, you know, let's try and move away from trying to make everything fully accessible, fully inclusive. We're not going to be able to do that because of the world we live in, but that and that kind of impacts the fear of getting it wrong. You know, let's try and be open and um, have honest conversations. Joined up approaches come up a lot. We need to have information sharing across different sectors and, you know, access to the work, actually telling people what they can and can't do a bit more about, you know, the, the, the little secrets to do with kind of getting around um, their application problems. And, and a big thing is training, you know, for, for employers. Um, trying to ensure that employers know and understand way more about disability and inclusion than than they than they have, and um, and that I think being led by disabled people and disabled people's organisations is is going to be um, really important to ensure it's actually fit for purpose. I mean, thanks for that, Bella, and then Seth Paul. I think um, if anything, the two years has shown us the last two years is we can change, we can adapt, we can do it differently. Now is a real opportunity. Include disabled people in your workplaces, listen to disabled people, and you'll build better products, better services, serve customers better, because you're serving people like us, like your customers, and include them in the workforce, and I think that would make the biggest change. And then talk about disability, talk about being disabled or having a long-term condition, and make that normal, because it is normal. Yeah. Bella, thank you. South Paul? I like everything's been said. Uh... Yeah, I, I mean, I, I like the point Phil made there because although you know a lot of my work is in digital and technology, what the last couple of years have told us is humans first. Focus on the human, focus on the connection, focus on the communication, focus on the education. Let's not be ignorant. Uh, let's be open-minded. Let's inform one another, uh, and let's let's move the conversation forward as quickly and as productively as we can, and let's make more impact. I think that's a really important point to finish. I think we, we, we've talked about. What, as a society, what we need to do. We talk about as employers, what do we need to do? This, this is all about the person, the individual person, and how we make that. that, that so that's a really important point you've just finished on. So we, we, we must end there. I mean, I, I just want to say thank you for, for, for obviously everybody that's joined us today and 
for making a big contribution. The, the comments and the questions were fantastic. I want to thank our, our, our panel, Bella Gore, Sathpal Singh, Professor Phil Taylor, and Naomi Walk for leading, I think, which was a really insightful discussion. Uh, I'd like to thank our VSL interpreters, uh, Max, Greg, and Heather Graham, who supported today's event. Thank you very much. And I want to take this opportunity to remind there is another online event taking place as part of this festival, and it's the Climate Crisis Hasn't Gone Away, and it starts at 12 o'clock tomorrow. There are also an events in the Scottish Parliament building if you're able to join us. So, for full information and to book your tickets, visit festivalpolitics.scot. Um, we've finished at four o'clock on the dot, so I'm delighted to say that you know, we've, we've met that objective. I, I certainly would like to pick up the issues that have been raised by all everybody here, and it's certainly something I'll be taking forward at the committee level. It's something I'd like to take forward with, with all every single one of you on the panel as well. Some really important issues and discussions. Really enjoyed that today. So, can I thank you very much? Can I thank the Parliament organisers as well for doing what they're doing today? And can I thank the audience for coming along and uh, wish you a happy day? Thank you very much, folks.